station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. NBC, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Chuck Todd with NBC. How do you hear me? Hey, hello from the International Space Station. I've got you loud and clear. Excellent. So this is Kate. Yep, we are uh, on board International Space Station as part of the Expedition 39 crew. Excellent. All right, so we can get started. All right. Ah, okay. All right, joining me now is astronaut Kate Rubens. She's a virologist on the International Space Station. She launched for space in early July for a four-month mission. Since she's been in orbit, Rubens has become the first person to sequence DNA in space. She added a piece of equipment to the outside of the space station during a spacewalk, and when she helped replace some toilet parts in the space station, she called herself a janitor. Kate, welcome to 1947. So tell me where you are right now. What do you see where are you orbiting over Earth? What's below us? Yeah, so uh, we actually are just coming up the coast of Africa. We're going to pass through Angola, central Congo, which is actually where I used to work. And then we're going to head up north towards Kazakhstan and uh, as high as we get at 51 degrees and head up towards the poles. Uh, it all happens very quickly. You actually have to be pretty good on the space station at recognizing things because we're going along at 17,500 miles an hour up here. How long do you gaze down? How often do you do it? So we're pretty busy during the day. We actually work about a 12-hour day. We've got so much research experiments and also just maintaining the space station up here. Uh, but every time we pass by a window, you do have to stop for a second and look at the Earth. Uh, sometimes you don't even know where you are. You've got to stop and check the map. But uh, it's so amazing outside. It's so incredibly beautiful. It does draw you in quite a bit. So you're a vi virologist. So just give me the, uh, obviously it's about uh, you're, you're trying to uh, study viruses, how they come about, how you stop them, things like that. But why are you doing this in space? Why is it important to do this in space? Yeah, so actually, uh, when NASA hires virologists or biologists or any scientists of that kind, they are really training astronauts to do a little bit of everything. So, for example, today I was doing a pharmacological experiment. Sometimes we're doing material science experiments. We're doing, uh, my crewmate is setting up a combustion experiment right now for the for uh, JAXA. So you end up being a bit of, of, of a generalist. We also teach our scientists how to fly airplanes and we teach our pilots how to be scientists. Uh, so you get to be a jack of all trades up here. You have to be a plumber some days, uh, potentially a dentist or a doctor. We train as chief medical officers and you need to be able to fix anything on the space station and do any science experiment the researchers send up. So you had just were talking about how you did a lot of research in the Congo. What motivated you to think I need to go to I need to do this in space. Yeah, so this is, this is, I would have to say, not where I thought I was going to end up. Uh, you know, you always could dream about being an astronaut, but uh, for me, I was planning on having a research career on viruses. I applied a little bit out of the blue to be an astronaut one day and thought maybe it would be a good story at some point to tell how I'd applied to be an astronaut and, and uh, how NASA had turned me down. And you kind of never know where you're going to end up in life. I ended up on the space station here. So your research, is it, is this research you wanted to do or are you doing research that NASA wants you to do in order to uh, help space exploration? I mean, obviously, if, if we end up testing the limits and going to farther into space, people will have to be up there even longer and, and fight viruses. Is that, is that the ultimate goal of your research? Yeah, so actually the, the research that I want to do and the research that NASA wants to do coincide quite well. 
Uh, and it's not just about viruses, it's really about all of microbiology, looking at what happens to not just viruses, but to bacteria in space. We have this whole microbiome on the space station that's a little bit unknown. It's been up here for 16 years and has had all kinds of effects of radiation and microgravity. We're, we're all in, uh, we're in free fall right now. I'm floating as I'm talking to you. And so what that does to microbial life is fascinating. What that does to physiology is fascinating as well. And this isn't just for us uh, at NASA working on exploring and going beyond low Earth orbit. This really, there's a lot of uh, implications for human health and disease. We can learn some basic principles by studying them in orbit. Do you have a, a lay example of a, of a disease or a virus that you already can tell would be, you know, its impact would be limited uh, in a space environment versus being lethal, for instance, on Earth? So we actually don't get transmission of viruses up here, which is fascinating when you think about it. We only have three human beings in space right now, and uh, we're all perfectly healthy. Uh, when there's no human beings around, there's nobody to transmit a virus to you. You do have some examples of viruses that we carry in our bodies. For example, uh, you know, everybody gets the chicken pox vaccine now, but if you are exposed to chicken pox as a child, you have that with you uh, dormant, and that actually can reactivate sometimes in space flight. So we do have examples of uh, some really interesting things happening with viruses in flight. Uh, we also have some examples of ways uh, that it's sometimes a little bit nice to be off the planet. We don't have to worry about catching a cold up here. Now, you yourself, right, you're, 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 you're an experiment, you yourself being up there. You're a Petri dish, correct? Absolutely. I'm participating uh, in over 100 different research experiments. So we take our blood, uh, we look at every physiological parameter, we even ultrasound our eyeballs, which sounds horrible at first and is actually uh, pretty cool. We can do that with water up here. We don't need ultrasound gel because the surface tension. Uh, and you can see things like your optic nerve, uh, you can see your cornea. We're very interested in how vision is affected by microgravity. We have a fluid shift upwards in space, and this is doing some interesting things to our visual system. So uh, this is an example of a lot of things that NASA is learning about, just basic uh, medical things from putting human beings into microgravity. What's, what's the biggest change you've noticed? Is it, you talked about eyesight, is, is it, have you, has your eyesight changed in space? So we have had examples of astronaut eyesight changing. The biggest thing that I've noticed is the fluid shift uh, upwards. So when you're walking around on Earth, you have this constant gravity vector that pulls all the fluid down into your legs. And you probably have never thought about this before. You just take this as a, as a given when you're walking around on the planet. But as soon as you are in free fall, all that fluid floats up. So we actually lose some of our plasma volume and we can feel a kind of a pressure in our head. And so that's doing some interesting things and has some implications for understanding diseases on Earth like intracranial pressure uh, and increased pressure on the back of your eyeball. So that's what I feel the most up here. You feel it really acutely the first few weeks, and then, like most things, uh, you just get used to it after a little bit. All right, tell me about downtime. You say 12-hour days. And by the way, do you, how do you orient a day? Do you, do you just, it, it, I assume there's, you know, do you have to, okay, this is going to be our uptime, and this is going to, do you orient your day to Houston time? Um, what are you oriented to? So we're actually on Greenwich Mean Time, and that helps us out because we're an international space station. We have partner agencies. We are working with Russia, Japan, countries all over Europe, Canada, and the U.S., and so we pick GMT and set that as our day. Uh, it's a little artificial. We have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets, so you could pick any time that you wanted to, but we need a circadian rhythm, so we pick a time each day, and that's when we start our schedule, uh, and all the control centers around the world will start uh, working with the crew at a certain wake-up time. They're actually working 24-7 uh, at all of these locations to run the space station 
uh, to keep all the systems going. And then we have a scheduled time where we, we start our work uh, and we start going. What, uh, how do you, what, what is your downtime? What do you do with it? You reading, you're communicating, what are you doing you're with reading, it? You're reading, you're probably going to laugh, but I do experiments. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I've gotten really interested in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, it's not work. It's, it's, it's fascinating um, to be in an environment where all of a sudden it seems like the laws of physics have changed. So everything you've ever known, you, you probably just have not thought about gravity very much. Maybe when you drop something or trip and sure. fall, uh, you're a little annoyed at gravity, but other than that, it's uh, it's actually a profound and incredibly strong force. And so, what happens to fluids? Uh, what happens to small amounts of fluids, large amounts of fluids? The overwhelming force of surface tension is all fascinating. Um, my other hobby has started to be photography. Yeah. Uh, so if you oh, take a look at the is. International Space Station oh, Facebook page. Um, I, I went a little crazy last weekend and took over 2,000 photos. I think they posted a few of them. Uh, my, my crewmate Takuya is also an excellent photographer, and, and between the two of us, we're always shutterbugs uh, looking out the windows at Earth. So I read you're a, you're a scuba, you, you, you like to scuba dive. I like to scuba dive. Um, what, there's some, what's the, what are the similarities between scuba diving and being in space, and I, I, I'm sure there's obvious differences, but I am curious of what similarities there are. There's actually a lot of similarities, and that was one of the things I was thinking when I first got up here is, wow, this is pretty similar to diving. So all the things that you'd have to do, for example, if you're balancing uh, on the tips of your fins and you're trying to just balance back and forth, uh, right. That's pretty similar to weightlessness. Right. Um, the attention to detail that you have to have with your equipment is very similar up here. That you know we are living in a machine. Well, We're surrounded by our life support equipment. Everything is about don't die, don't die, don't die. Right? If you don't follow a certain protocol, you'll you're risking your life. I mean, when you go through the training on scuba diving, I always feel like they're trying to scare the living daylights out of you. But is it that that's the same feeling? Well, space is an inherently dangerous business. I mean, you do get that feeling that you are in a remote environment, and uh, NASA and all of the partner agencies are incredible at what they do, but it is a dangerous business, and you're surrounded outside by absolute vacuums. So it is critical at all times to really uh, pay attention, to have that attention to detail. One of the things that helps us up here is we have ground teams 24-7 supporting us. So we've got folks in mission control that are looking out for us all the time. Uh, and, and the one time that I really felt like, okay, you're on your own, uh, you really better do this right, is when we were doing our spacewalk outside. That's the point where it's you and your buddy outside, and uh, you've got folks watching you. They're watching the spacesuit, but you need to uh, absolutely uh, be on the top of your game every second uh, when you're outside in absolute vacuum. Speaking of that, you uh, apparently said that you can tell space does have a smell, and you noticed it during, uh, during a decompression. What's the smell of space? It's a little bit metallic. It smells uh, a little bit like, like ozone, and it's got a sharp metallic smell to it. I could almost taste it. Uh, when we were taken off the spacesuits after we'd been outside. That's interesting. So are you following current events? Did you guys watch the debate, the first debate? We are enjoying very much being off the planet right now. Yeah. <laughs> we are, uh, I, we're a little detached from current events. So uh, Is there room uh, we catch there? the news every now and then. You know, is, 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 more of us might want to join you. It's actually, uh, you know, they do say there's a, an overview effect for astronauts, and you do feel that. Um, when, you, when you get a little bit far away from humanity, you can see the planet down below. You know all your loved ones are there. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit nice just to get away from it all. And, uh, and you see the beauty of the Earth. Uh, you see the stars. Uh, they don't 
they don't twinkle here. They're just shining. You can see the entire Milky Way. And I think that gives you a little bit of a perspective about our universe and what's important. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes you can leave some of these earthly things behind. Uh, your replacement crew has been delayed. It means you may be delayed. Was, was that a double-edged sword? Or you have, it sounds like you're enjoying your time up there, but I'm sure you miss family as well. Yeah, we do miss family. We get a chance to keep in touch with our loved ones. And, uh, you know, it's really incredibly important to take care of the space station. So this is uh, something that, that folks have built from hundreds of countries over decades. And so we are enjoying the opportunity to take care of the space station. And we're certainly going to look forward to welcoming, welcoming our new crewmates up here uh, and showing them uh, this amazing machine that people have built. I think they're going to love it as their new home. Uh you may miss the election. Are you still going to be able to vote? Yes. So I registered as an absentee ballot addressed to low Earth orbit, and uh, they do let you vote from space. Addressed to low Earth orbit. And, and does it count as what, what state? I mean, you know, that, that matters. What, what, does it, uh, what state does your vote count in? Is it, does it end up Texas, or is it your home? Well, we live in we live in Houston, so Houston, Texas, is where my uh, my ballot will be counted from. All right. Do you, uh, when you if you do any free time that isn't experimenting, uh, do you binge TV? Is it more reading? Is it just uh, is it connecting with family? Yeah, I'll make phone calls to family and friends. Uh, I read some magazines and, and newspapers up here. I actually took my um, my iPad into the cupola and, and tucked in the window so I could just completely see the earth and read a magazine last weekend. Uh, that was a pretty phenomenal experience. So I, I understand you're a, a fan of Battlestar Galactica. How, uh, how uh, off is Battlestar Galactica? In its, uh, in its depiction of space. You know, one of the things that I was the most struck here, when I, I'm a fan of science fiction in general, and uh, when you watch science fiction, they always show a small craft orbiting a planet. And I don't know how the folks in Hollywood know so accurately what that looks like, but they have just absolutely gotten it right. And and any show that you watch okay. uh, where you've got a small ship okay. orbiting this huge planet, that is exactly what it looks like up here. I had that sensation the first time I looked at the Earth that we really do live on a planet, uh, and, it, and it looks like what you see with all the special effects. That actually, uh, I would say that's pretty close. It brings it home. Is there any movie recently that uh, there was a... What was the, there was the movie the Mar the uh, the Martian that got into the whole idea of trying to create I guess an Earth bio, Earth biolog a biological atmosphere similar similar to Earth. How did they do? How did the how did Hollywood do in the depiction of that versus what you're doing in the space station? I have to say, we do uh, comment sometimes that we feel like the, the Martian up here. So uh, we can grow plants up here. Uh, right now we're doing some experiments with them. So the seedlings are just about the size of your finger, and I'm not allowed to eat the experiments. Um, we <laughs> but we, uh, we are doing a lot just in, in reality. I mean, this is, this is an interesting case of sometimes the reality in, in Hollywood are uh, in a race, and, and I think the reality sometimes is outpacing Hollywood. We have a life support system up here that recycles 90% of our water. We completely recycle our air. We're a closed loop system. So we don't have to launch a lot of that from Earth anymore. We can turn water into air. We can turn coffee into water. Uh, we can completely support human beings with just a little bit of maintenance. And, uh, and like I said, it's 90%, so it takes some addition to the system. But you would think it's science fiction, and, and we are proving that technology every day on the space station. All right, when you come home, what's the first food you want to eat because you miss it so much up there? 
I would say any fresh fruit or vegetable. Uh, we get those occasionally on a supply ship that comes up, but the taste of something crunchy uh, that's grown in the earth would be pretty good right now. Well, Kate Rubens, I know you've got a lot of work to do. Um, thanks for taking the time. This was fun. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my crewmates wanted to say hi as well, and uh, we'll sign off from the International Space Station. Great. Tell them hello, and we hope they love watching Meet the Press. We'll keep shipping it up there, I promise. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you, NBC Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.